Okay, so uh, just as you're wrapping that up, I'll uh, let you finish writing that and you can hand it in at the end of the class. Uh, just uh, some, some background administrative issues. The course projects for this course um, are going to be looked at in class on Wednesday. I'll discuss a bit about it in class. I'll post a posting to the website with some details. That's, so that's going to start and run for the next four or five weeks. Um, now, it's not going to be as big a piece of a work as some co other course projects are, so it's, it's, it's going to be manageable, let's put it that way. The um, related to that is uh, just a quick comment on tutorials. So tutorial attendance obviously has dropped off over this term. Um, that often happens, but it was really low last week and the week, um, and I'm expecting it low today un unless I make a comment otherwise here in class. Um, the, I don't mind if you don't attend tutorial if you really are on top of the work, but um, I do strongly suggest you attend for, if only one reason, is that you've got probably two of the best TAs I've ever had for a course ever. Um, so Jaffer and James are right on top of this stuff. They've just finished graduate courses in this material. Uh, they use it in their research. They know GANs backwards. They can definitely help you out with any concepts that you're struggling with. So see the tutorial time not just to get ahead on your assignment, but to ask questions about the content covered in class. So if something wasn't clear in class, that's the time where you can ask them questions as well. It doesn't have to just be on the, um, the topics related to the assignment. So I strongly suggest you attend those tutorials for that reason. And also we'll be um, leveraging their help in the course project. So they'll be, uh, like in 4N where there was group meetings, they'll be part of that and working with you on your projects and um, making sure that it's really a good project that you deliver at the end. So I strongly suggest you uh, re-attend the tutorials if you've dropped out of that for, for the past week or two. Okay, um, so just to wrap up then, let, let you finish this uh, piece of paper. If you're not done yet, uh, make some more comments and hand it up here at the front on your way out. So let's then move to the other handout. Uh, I'm calling this class eight. This is week eight in the semester. There's 13 weeks in the semester, so we're in week eight. Uh, you notice that we've skipped week si uh, seven. We've gone, in terms of handouts, right from six to eight. Week seven uh, was then that gap for the midterm and reading week. So let's, um, because it's been such a while, recall what we've actually been looking at for the past um, few lectures. And that is to solve an unconstrained optimization problem. Okay, now, probably by Wednesday's class, I'll bring constraints in. But we'd said earlier that we can actually omit constraints for nonlinear optimization because often the, the function itself provides a natural bound and we can always check obvious constraints afterwards, right? So if you're optimizing, say, for the diameter of a pipe, you would check, of course, that you get a positive diameter. You don't need to necessarily enforce the constraint that the diameter must be greater than zero. Uh, you can just simply check your final solution. So unconstrained problems work well and what we've been looking at is the single variable case and the multivariable case. We've looked at both so far. So let's recap in the single variable case. Um, the reason why I've written this function up here is you're going to see parallels between this case and the multidimensional case, which you would expect. Um, but since we can often draw and visualize a, a single dimension function quite readily, it helps to see the one-to-one -one mapping between this uh, function approximation. So we take our function and do a Taylor series approximation around a certain point. It's got a der first derivative f dash of xk multiplied by x minus xk, so some deviation around it, plus a second derivative will give us some higher level approximation, improved approximation to that function. And what we derived in last class is that when we set that p of x equal to 0, um, sorry, the first derivative of p of x equal to 0, we automatically solve the optimization problem. So if your objective is to min or max the function, you can convert that optimization problem into an algebraic problem by converting it as follows. Take the first derivative, set it to 0, and the solution to this equation is the optimum for the min or max. Now, when we do that, what we found last time was we found Newton's method. 
And Newton's method just simply said that delta x is equal to the negative of the first derivative of x over the second derivative of x. We can do that for single dimensional functions where f of x is a scalar and that's a scalar. We can calculate that ratio and it tells us how much change in x to make. With multi dimensions we won't be able to do this but there is the equivalent matrix form of this that we'll end up uh, with in a few minutes from now. Okay, so we're going to see the, the multivariable form. This is the univariate form. Now, we've got a problem. Sometimes we might not be able to estimate f dash of x or f second derivative. They might be too difficult, too complex, and so we can approximate them. And that's what the quasi-Newton method does. So again, no surprise that later on you will see Newton's method for multivariable equations, and then we'll see the quasi-Newton method for multivariable equations. Now, here's an insightful piece of information. We've seen earlier that at the optimum, f dash of x is equal to 0. Okay, so we, that's how we found that optimum. Now, take a look at that equation up there. If f dash of x is equal to 0 at the optimum, we learned also, let's just write it up here, we also learned that for a minimum, the second derivative of f at the optimum, make it x star, is positive. And if you're maximizing, the second derivative at the optimum is negative. Well, let's just go back and interpret that in terms of that Taylor series approximation over there. If we look at that Taylor series approximation, f of x let's look at f of x at the optimum is equal to f of x star plus let's take a look at the second term now that term there is zero that term falls away because at the optimum the first derivative of f is equal to zero so plus zero plus let's write out this last term a half of the second derivative of f at the optimum times x star minus xk squared. Okay. And I'm just going to take a look at the case of a minimization. Okay. The max will follow logically. If we're trying to minimize this function, we know that it's a minimum if the second derivative is positive. If we take a look at that, it says the second derivative is positive. It implies that this term over here is positive. Furthermore, we know that whatever this is, it's positive as well. Okay, because it's squared. So the way you can interpret this is imagine that you're at your optimum. So this is f of x. Imagine you're at your optimum, we're trying to minimize. This is your point x star, and you move some distance away from x star. So if you move by a small amount away from x star, either up or down, doesn't matter, this term, this, this shift that you move left or right is still positive, that term. So it says that if you truly are at the minimum, you're at some value of f of x star, plus a positive component, plus a positive component. If you deviate, in other words, from x star, your function is only going to go up, whether you deviate to the left or you deviate to the right. Okay. So that follows quite nicely from the Taylor series approximation, that we can see that enforced. If you're at your optimum, the only direction you can go by moving either left or right in x is up. f of x will increase. You're at some baseline plus some components. Okay? So that's insightful. And the only reason why I'm emphasizing this is because we're going to try and draw parallels to the multidimensional equivalent later on. Okay, not in today's class, but in the next class, the similar idea will apply. Okay, so what here's a little quick challenge for yourself, a few minutes. Repeat this at home for the case of maximization. Make sure that you can reinterpret that Taylor series approximation in terms of maximization. And it 
the same should hold. Yeah. I think that first term should be f of x at k. Yeah. This term here? So I'm saying at the optimum. Oh, OK, sorry, yeah, yeah, so my mistake, yeah. So it's some, some baseline point where you are plus some deviation. Yeah. OK, thanks for picking it up. OK, so the interpretation is this is just some nominal baseline plus a, a, a delta that you're moving. OK, so let's move on from that point. This is the univariate case. Now let's go back to where we were uh, just at the end of the week prior to reading week, we looked at the multivariate case. And we saw the multivariate case can be interpreted in the idea of climbing up a mountain or um, going down into a valley. So let's look at, since we're talking about minimization, let's just keep going that way. Multidimensionally, we're at this current iterate xk. And what we saw in last class 6b, if you're going back to your notes, is we're going down this hill and we go in the direction of the gradient. And we calculate the first derivative um, over there. So upside down triangle this time. First derivative of f at that current location. And if we're trying to maximize, we go up the gradient. And if we're trying to minimize, we go negative to the gradient. Now, we learned then that you can go and take, a s this is simply your direction. You can take a single step along that direction. That would be alpha equals 1. Or you can take two steps along that direction, alpha 2, 3, or some fraction of alpha. You don't need to even take a full step. And what we did is we learned how to use line search as a way to figure out how much of a step we should take. So the unit step isn't always useful. The unit step often will overshoot and be too big of a step. So we want to scale back. Or in some cases, the unit step might not be enough, and you want to go double the unit step. So we put this scalar in front of it, alpha, and then alpha tells us how much we should go. If you look at this function across this line, so imagine you put a plane there and simply drew what that function looked like. In this particular example, we would see that f over here and then my horizontal axis is some amount alpha. I'm at some value when alpha is equal to 0. And if I take some sort of step, I'm going to drop. And then if I go too big again, alpha will start to increase. So that's if essentially the cross section at along that blue dashed line there. We can go find this optimum over here. We call that alpha star in the lectures prior. And we're done for that single iteration. We find alpha star, the, the distance along this blue line. That becomes our new location for our next iteration, and we, re and we continue from there. Uh, in the midterm, we uh, chose the, the size of the alpha steps that we took uh, based on our knowledge of the, the problem itself and right. the size of the, the delta x uh, vector. Good, yeah. Uh, OK, so the algorithms, when they do that, they start with a unit step, and then they go double that, and then they look at those three numbers. So in the same way in the midterm, if you had um, the ability to quickly evaluate the function, you could just take blindly take any of the three alpha values. And you're looking for the three-point pattern. So they go up and down again, or if you're trying to minimize, they go down and back up again. So and that's exactly how a computer algorithm will do it. It will just keep stepping until it finds a three-point pattern and it solves that. Okay. Yeah. OK. Um, in the midterm, that was the main reason why I gave you the drawing. So you could see then that alpha of one step would be far too big, and then you would you'd scale back. So when we try to, um, that's what we did in the, in the last class. And I ended up showing to you, let's just quickly perhaps go back to those slides, um, 6b. That if you, if you follow that process, um, you can you take your first step over there from the starting point, go along the gradient, find the optimum. And then I'd ask you to, to repeat that for some more iterations. And I, I gave you the results in the slides from last time and show that you'd la land at that point. Then you would go in this direction, then that direction. 
and you eventually zigzag and you approach that optimum there, that triangle. Here's another example I showed last time for another function and again a tremendous amount of zigzagging before you approach the optimum. So this gradient method, the key <coughs> problem I want to point out here is that the gradient method we learnt about only uses the first derivative, that upside down triangle. So the first derivative information is only being used and that's what causes that inefficiency. So can we go and add the second derivative information. Like we did for the univariate case, let's just go back here and contrast this. I could have taken this Taylor series and just stopped it at the first term. But if we add the second derivative information there, we get and derive Newton's method and we get a very powerful optimizer there. Well, let's go try this now with the multidimensional case. And what we in fact land up with is this fairly messy looking equation down here. Um, and it's doing exactly the same thing. It's taking the function f, approximating it with a polynomial now, where we start at some baseline, plus our first derivative, plus our second derivative. But the reason why it's so messy is because, well, we don't just have one x that we're trying to use as our search variable. We've got x1, x2, up to xn. So this is the key um, nom nomenclature. It's not here on your slides. To add, there is that n is your number of search variables. Okay, so if this is a, a two-dimensional space with x1 and x2, this derivative here is a two-dimensional vector, and this matrix H, which is a matrix of second order partial derivatives is a two by two matrix. So if n is two for x1 and x2, you take the partial derivatives all the way up to the second derivative for the two variables. So let's um, write it up here and then you're going to do an exercise where you get to try this out. Because while this all looks very messy on the board and on the slides, um, it's actually fairly straightforward. So to emphasize for two search variables, n is equal to 2, that matrix H is the first derivative of f with respect to x1. And then you take the, the derivative of the first derivative. So it's the second derivative of f with respect to x1. And then the second position is d2f dx squared. And that notation there indicates that the off diagonal in this case would be d df dx1 dx2 and this entry here would be df dx2 dx1 okay. it's always a square matrix it's always a square matrix and it's always symmetrical you might recall from your math courses that this term over there is the exact same as the one symmetrical to it. So let's just draw it in a different color. These two entries are exactly the same number. Okay, so the nice thing about this Hessian matrix as it's called is that you only need to calculate the entries on the diagonal and on the upper or lower triangle and then you just copy and paste over. Shouldn't be that D2 squared? Oh, yeah, sorry. Okay. Okay. So let's uh, let's give this a try then, uh, because this is, as I said, it's not too difficult. Here's an example. Let's let's give this a go. Let's try and approximate that function f, a function of two variables, and we're going to approximate this locally. So uh, perhaps just one thing to point out, uh, you can stay on the page where you were, but this approximation is at the baseline plus in some neighborhood alpha times delta x away. So we're going to generate a, an approximation of this function locally. I'll show you a, a, a geometric interpretation of this in a minute. Okay, so go ahead and just substitute in there. So you're going to need to know f of x, k, you're going to need to the first derivatives, you're going to need delta x, and you're going to need matrix H. Um, 
Now there is a little bit of, I think, yeah, on your handout, there might be a little bit of a cutoff over there. Uh, that last term is delta x. Okay, so let's just work up to the first derivative for now and then uh, we'll take it from there. So the first derivative of f with respect to x1, symbolically, and then x1 over x2. Okay, so then if you sub in delta f at the current point we are asked is to minus 3 and 1, then that has a value of 0 and minus 3. Okay. So perhaps let's, um, let me just do this part for you. I'm just going to take it up. Let's ignore the, the quadratic portion. Let's just do the single, uh, the first derivative approximation. And then we'll work on that last part there. So take what we have right now. We could write that as P of x plus some alpha delta x. So we're approximating that function in some local neighborhood there. It's equal to 2 is the value of the function at minus 3, 1. Right? I don't, let's maybe just put it there for you to, to check. f at minus 3, 1 is equal to 2. So that's where that 2 comes from. plus alpha. Now let's sub in there. Let's leave, uh, um, let's put this in my upside down triangle f dash of xk. So that's 0 and 3. And we've asked to, uh, it's transposed. Okay. Times delta x1, delta x2. Okay, this is why, why we're going through this example is to really emphasize the matrix form here. So if we simplify this a little bit, then we get 2 plus. And the key is, the key thing you have to recognize is that this output must be a scalar, right? So what we have here on the left-hand side is a scalar value. So we need to end up with a result that's a scalar. So right now we've got a matrix equation. Let's just simplify that a little bit. So if we sub in there, we're going to get plus alpha times 3 delta x2. Okay. So that's our current approximation of the function up to the first derivative. So it says that if you looked at that function there, x1 plus long, log, long x2 plus 2, if you looked at it and just approximated in a small neighborhood alpha times delta x, that's a good approximation to that function. Sorry? Oh. Right, and then, thanks, good catch. Okay, so then I'd like you to now take this and let's add the Hessian in. So calculate h of x at the minus 3 plus 1 location, and then sub in the matrix form and, comp and improve the approximation. So what we're going to do is then add some more over here. So give that a chance if you haven't done it already. The first one will just put the first derivative, right? This is just the first derivative information. Now we're going to add the plus alpha squared over 2 part. Okay, so what are those derivatives symbolically in the second derivative matrix? So the first entry is 0. The bottom right entry is also 0. Uh, 1 over x2. No, bottom right isn't 0. No, definitely not. So this is the second derivative of f with respect to x2. Okay. 
minus x1 over x2 squared. Okay, and then because this is symmetric, we know that that is exactly the same number. Okay, so if we sub in the values at minus 3 plus 1, we get a matrix that's 0, 1, 1, 3. Okay, so let's, uh, let's then continue on this approximation. Let's add the alpha squared over 2 plus the delta x. So delta x1, delta x2 plus the Hessian. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to bump this all over and make myself some more space. So it's the prior answer plus Then the Hessian comes in here, 0, 1, 1, 3. And then this last term. OK, so it's ju then just a little bit of algebra, and you can try that out. So I'm going to put in the prior answer is 2 minus 3 alpha delta x2. And then this new part that you add in there, you should once you work through this matrix uh, multiplication, get plus alpha squared times delta x1, delta x2. And then another term, plus 3 over 2 alpha squared, delta x2 squared. Okay, And notice that that's a scalar result, which it should be. The symmetry goes all the way, right? So the diagonals, are, all the the diagonals are, are different, and then anything on the off diagonals are symmetric. The entire matrix is symmetrical. OK, yeah. okay so the purpose of this example then is to illustrate that we can approximate these functions with a Taylor series, but that Taylor series really gets messy in multiple dimensions. Now, not only do you need your first derivative, which is really fairly easy to get, but the second derivative matrix H can get messy. And if you've got n search variables, you now have an n by n matrix. So you've got a lot of potentially really messy functions in that Hessian matrix. Okay. Where, where software like GAMS and Ample and some of the other optimizing software that's available out there their utility is that they calculate that H matrix for you automatically. They automatically differentiate the functions and find the second derivatives automatically and create the H matrix for you. So you don't have to do that. Um, but understanding what, the, what it's doing is valuable. And so let's um, perhaps look at this uh, geometrically. I understand that looking at it algebraically isn't always the easiest. So let's examine what this why we've gone to all that trouble. And the reason is quite simple. If we look back at our univariate case, has everyone done here on this board? I can erase it No. OK. So if we look back at our univariate case, we took our function, we approximated with a polynomial, and we set the first derivative of that polynomial equal to 0. So we set p dash of x equal to 0. Now if we look at the matrix equivalent, we can go say, take the first derivative of that polynomial approximation and set it equal to 0. What we're also going to do is we're going to set alpha equal to 1. Alpha equal to 1 is what we call the Newton step. So this is Newton's method in multiple dimensions. Newton's method says take a full step. So alpha is equal to 1. The matrix form is given up here. And if you solve that, it's, it's pretty messy, but you land up with probably this very well-known equation. So I'll, I'll write it out here again because I'm going to add some information to it for you. So you get your Hessian matrix multiplied by delta xk is equal to the negative first derivative of f of xk. Oops, sorry. 
The reason why I wanted to write this out this way is this matrix H is your second derivative matrix. And this over here is your first derivative. Now matrices, we, we can't go do this. What I'm going to show you on the board is wrong. But conceptually, you can understand it this way. You can take it as delta x is equal to the negative f of xk divided by h of xk. And that's Newton's method. Newton's method is the ratio of your first derivatives over your second derivatives. And you put a negative sign in front of it. right? But you can't practically go do this. Firstly, this numerator is a vector, and this denominator is a matrix. And that doesn't, doesn't compute. Right? But if this was reduced down to a single dimension, then your numerator is a scalar, your denominator is a scalar, and, and that does compute. But in matrix form, because we can't do that, we leave it like that. And we solve it exactly like this. Let's take a look at the dimensions here. H is an n by n matrix. Delta x is your search amount in each of your search variables. So you're going to step each of your search variables, x1, x2, up to xn by that amount. So that's an n by 1 matrix. And this is the vector of partial derivatives, the, of the partial first derivatives. So it's the derivative of f with respect to x1, the derivative of f with respect to x2, the derivative of up to xn. Okay. Now you've seen this equation before. This is no, no difference to this equation that you've all solved in your first year linear algebra courses and with Dr. Adams 3E, AX equals B. Okay? And you know that the solution to that, you're trying to solve for X, that's what you're trying to find, is equal to the inverse of A multiplied by B. So inverse is just like division in the scalar case. But obviously for matrices we can't write it like that. But that is the matrix solution. So we could write our answer like this. And that is, in fact, what's printed here on the slide over there for us, is the negative of the inverse of the Hessian matrix multiplied by the first derivative. OK, so that explanation works for those of you that have got an algebraic inclination and like to see things that way. Let's try and please those of you that look at things geometrically. I, prefer the geometric vision uh, myself. So what we're doing is the green dashed lines are our true function. That's what we're trying to optimize. And the optimum is sitting somewhere down here. Okay, we just don't know that. But these green lines are the contours. And that point xk is my current starting point. What all of this complication does that we've just looked at is it approximates that green dashed line with a quadratic two-dimensional, two in this case we've got two search variables, so two-dimensional polynomial equation given by the red contours. So you see that these red contours form the contours of a polynomial. They're concentric ovals in this case, and that is the contour of a quadratic. If you don't recall that from your math course, that, that's something you should know. But just in case you forgot that, notice that this red curve approximates the green curve really well over here, particularly right at that point xk, which it should. That's what the Taylor series does, is it approximates that function really well at the current location. So notice how the red curve matches the green curve really well initially and then deviates. So what we're essentially doing then is optimizing that red function rather than the green function. We're approximating the green function with the red one. And so what we will do is we simply say, where is the optimum of this red function? I know where it is. This result over here tells me where that optimum is. It says, simply take a single move from xk right to that center point. That's the best optimum you can get right now with the information you have. So don't, don't move halfway. Don't take half a step or a three-quarter step. Just move the full step, and you're done. That's Newton's method. Take a full step given by the solution to this black equation over here. So then our next iteration says, OK, well, that's going to be my starting point. And I'm going to repeat this. I'm going to refit 
an approximation to the green. So the red function goes away. We replace it with a new quadratic approximation at that point and find another step. Okay. So the key, key insight here is we're using not only first derivative information, we're also using second derivative information. And because we're using so much information, we're getting a really good approximation of the green curve. And so we should converge to that optimum. In this example, you'll probably get there in three hops. Okay. And it's not uncommon that this Newton's method converges extremely rapidly to the optimum because it has so much approximation power of the function. OK, so let's um, at least start an example. We've got just a few minutes, but it, it doesn't hurt to start with this example. So what you can do so long is simply set up, I'll give you some guidance here. This, this example problem says to follow Newton's method. Newton's method is written up here. The two things that you can get right away is your first derivative function of f. So find that. And also find your Hessian matrix of x. Okay, so find those two symbolically. And then you've actually done most of the work here. So you, you're not doing this at any particular point right now. Just do this all symbolically. You're going to need the first derivative and the second derivative matrix, potentially for several iterations. So it's easiest to just calculate them symbolically and then use them afterwards. So I'll give you the answer to the easier one. OK, so let's just uh, take a look here at Newton's method. We won't have a chance to finish it, but you can go complete it up at home. So we'll start with an initial guess, x0. Let's start at the 0, 0 point. And the reason is so we can compare this problem to the one we did in class 6b, where we started right there as well. Step two in Newton's method says to compute the gradients and the Hessian matrix. So you've got half of that information up there. So go ahead and do that at your own time. Step three is check if you're already at the optimum. You might be lucky that your first derivative is small already. If it is, then you stop and you simply report that xk is your solution. If it's not, then you go to step four and five, where you compute the Hessian matrix multiplied by delta x times the first derivative function. Now, that is a matrix equation, ax equals b. So it's going to be something like this that you have to solve, ax equals b. I'm going to leave you to do that. You're going to probably need to use MATLAB or look up some article on how to calculate a matrix inverse again. But essentially, what you want to solve is solve that equation for delta x. So let's come next class and see what our delta x's are. And then we'll go to the next iteration.